I, I'm just filled with joy. I know on Christmas Eve we sing many of these and we get to sing them together. And I know it's Advent and it's not theologically correct to be singing some of these now. But what a joy it is to sing them together for those of us that can't be here together on Christmas Eve. It's just wonderful. A little congregational participation this morning. All right. If I were to sing, which I'm not, and you may all be, give thanks right now for that, but if I were to say, uh, when you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Very good. And I think there's another verse, if you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. That's right. We, we have that clue. And as we study the first carols of Christmas, we realize that the Hebrew people, when they were happy, and they knew it, they sang. Of course, if they were terrified and they knew it, they sang. If they were deep in sorrow, they sang because they sang their faith. Remember, in a culture that would not have lots of written material, it is so much easier to remember a tune or even a chant uh, when it is set to music. That is why uh, our, shall we say, founding theological fathers, uh, John Wesley, who was a theologian, and Charles Wesley, the hymn writer, he won the battle when he said, John, no one has ever left humming one of your sermons, but they do leave humming my songs. So they sang their hymns, their psalms, their canticles. This Advent, we hear God's story in the Gospel of Luke, and there is a hymn, a psalm, a canticle put on the lips of four characters. We've heard of... Uh, the angels and the shepherds that first night, we heard of Gabriel and Elizabeth as they talked to Mary. And today we learn probably from the most famous and the most infamous, the Magnificat. In our background, Mary is a young lady, probably 12, 13 years old. And she has um, heard this announcement, this annunciation from the angel Gabriel. Now, it's unusual in many ways, not only that she was so young, not only that an angel showed up, but God is doing something remarkable from a nobody girl in a nowhere town. Because remember, Nazareth was like the low-income housing of the big city of Sepphoris. And he says, Hail Mary, you are full of grace. And so we ask ourselves, are we grace-filled? He says, you're going to have a son, the son of God. And then immediately Elizabeth makes arrangements, or pardon me, Mary makes arrangements to go and see her cousin Elizabeth because um, the angel says, you know, Elizabeth's going to have a baby too, even though, you know, she's, she's a little, got a little white up here, you know, on the rooftop and all of that. But it's quite unusual, and that's what you'll see. Mary enters into Elizabeth's house, and immediately Elizabeth, is filled with the Holy Spirit, and she sings out, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Imagine, you know, we, we heard, Mary, did you know? We heard the wonderful choir anthem where she is praying. Can you picture Mary and that choir anthem that we just heard? Ten days to get from Nazareth to Ein Karim, where Elizabeth and her husband, Zachariah, lived. Ten days of wondering... Did, did I imagine that? You know, what in the world is happening? Have I, have I lost my mind? And then that very moment of affirmation as Elizabeth recognizes what God is doing in Mary without explanation, that the Holy Spirit tells that. Mary, did you know? She may not have known the, the fullness of what was happening, but here we come today. After the walk and after the wondering we come to the Sunday of joy. Mary is seized by joy in her heart. There may have been fear. It may have been a fierce walk, but she is filled with joy, and her heart begins to sing. And it is a dangerous song. How many of you here have ever read a banned book? Raise your hand if you've read a banned book. And remember, the Bible is banned in many countries, so I would hope you would at least... <laughs> You know, you've read one or two verses out of a band book. So as we uh, come to this song, it, is a, it was, and, and time still is, a band song. In 1980s in Guatemala, it was illegal for the Magnificat to be read out loud in worship. In a time where uh, people were realizing that there was corruption and... Uh, 
well, let's just say not the best practices in their government. They did not want this song of liberation to be read out loud for fear it would lead to a revolt. I had the, the humbling privileges of being in, in several churches in Guatemala after, after the Civil War in Guatemala and to hear the Christians and what it cost them to be faithful, but also how they were inspired by what God was doing with Mary and others. It was pretty amazing. In Nicaragua, those who were trying to overthrow a corrupt regime would, would copy out by hand the Magnificat and keep it folded and keep it on their person in a pocket or, or, or in some way that they would have it with them. And that would be a sign, much like drawing the fish in the sand, they would have a copy of the Magnificat and it would keep them going when it seemed as if nothing would change. Even slaves in the United States would, would preach and teach and give this story one to another and repressed people around the globe have found in Mary's song God's mercy <coughs> toward those who have been pushed down and pushed aside and made to live lives that are less than. God lifts up the lowly and God warns that God will deal with those who are the oppressors and their pride has become a sin. It's a dangerous song, but we hear the first half of it beginning in Luke 1, verse 46, and we'll share that right now. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Exuberance and joy, magnificat. It comes from the word magnify, to make bigger, uh, I am finding a magnifying glass handier and handier as, as years go by at different times, but to make bigger. Now, when we see this and we hear this and Mary begins to sing, it is not that God's grace and mercy and love has suddenly expanded because she has begun to sing. It is that her understanding of God is growing. It is that her understanding of how God is acting in the world, not only through her, but just that God continues to keep the promises that were made from generation to generation has begun to grow. She has, a switch has been turned on in her faith life, and she can understand God to an even greater and deeper extent. On a real simple way, I, I, I admit, the image that kept coming to me over and over again was in The Grinch Stole Christmas, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. There's that scene, and it shows an x-ray of his heart, and it said, that day his heart grew three sizes. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, her heart and her mind is, is growing as she sees the largeness of what God does in the world and her part in it. She sings, and she says, I understand God more and more, and rejoice, rejoice. If we would have had a children's time, the word rejoice, now I won't make you do this one, it is literally the idea of leaping for joy. Have you ever been so excited about something, or something came to you, and you understood it so well, or, or you got through something that was blocked, that you just couldn't sit still? You know, that, yes, this is it, you know, one of those eureka moments. So literally jumping for joy is the term of her rejoice. And I think, why was she rejoicing? It was probably not just because she was going to have a baby. Because uh, this was not the kind of pregnancy that she's going to, shall we say in our language, Twitter out. No sonogram pictures on Facebook, no nothing. This is something that she is not even talking about yet. This is something that has many repercussions, and as the story expands, because we remember that to be pregnant and not married at that time was uh, a death sentence, to be stoned to death along with the man. But again, she begins to sing. She is rejoicing because it has dawned on her that the great God can use even her, a nobody from Nowheresville, and, and she begins to, boy, God can use me, and I hope right now there is a moment in your heart where you're thinking, that's what God does. 
And not without fear, but maybe with a little bit of your own expectancy, you wonder, God, what are you going to ask me to do? What, how can you use me? It's not always, you know, it, it, is, is, it is almost always in the scripture that God uses those who, who what did they say? They won't be expecting that. Remember in the video? So all of these ways and in the places where you are, God will use you. God continues to use you. You hear me say that over and over again because God works through the people of the current generation over and over and over again. Do you see that pattern? God does what God always does. He consistently chooses the least expected to be his instruments. God cares about, he sides with, and he uses the marginalized of society. Adam Hamilton, in his sermon on this subject, he says, it is the lowly, the powerless, the unimportant, the insignificant, as close to the ground as you can get. Picture that imagery. Those who are as close to the ground as you can get that God consistently uses. So Mary sings. God has magnified me. Mary, the one who is full of grace, is chosen by God who is full of of mercy. So our first question for this particular sermon is, are we merciful? God's hesed love, that's the word hesed, God's hesed love with the strong meaning of mercy and kindness, not just a warm feeling, but actions of mercy and kindness, the incarnation, if you will, the, the living of mercy and kindness. So to be formed by this first carol of Christmas is to grow in our area of being merciful. Are you closer this year to the words we hear in the prophet Micah when he says that the Lord requires of you now, there's no getting around that. There's no scooch room. It's not a suggest, would like, would be really happy, will give you a gift with purchase if you. No, it is the Lord requires of you that you love this hesed love, this strong and unbending love of mercy, and to do justice and to walk humbly with our God. So we ask to be formed in this season of Advent as we stand between hope and fulfillment. Lord, where am I on that line of being more toward the fulfillment of your mercy and your justice and your love in the world? Mary's song continues in the second half. It is a bit unsettling. It's a bit unnerving. It's about what happens to those who are merciless. He has performed, God has performed deeds with his mighty arm, and he has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. We begin again, and we hear, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and filled up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Now you might understand why it might be banned in certain places. It is distinct in that it tells us that God acts for the lowly, and God uses strength and power for the oppressed, and he uses those same strengths against those who are merciless. And that's a little bit rough, because we realize that all of us, even if we're on fixed incomes, even if we're on unemployment, we are richer than the majority of the people on the planet. I am very grateful to serve a place that also uses those blessings in many ways to bless others for mercy and for justice. The question comes, so where do we look for a place to learn and grow? Where is the cautionary tale? Where can we be changed and be formed? And uh, Hamilton made a very interesting thing, and he was reflecting on being scattered in our thoughts. Now, I won't ask if any of us get a little scatterbrained every once in a while, okay, that, that we kind of lose our way, you know, a few more Christmas parties and a little more sugar cookie icing, and boom. But 
The idea of when our thoughts become changed or even corrupted, when our innermost thoughts become tied to pride, then sometimes that tends to create disarray in our integrity or our morals. There are many, many examples, too many examples, where the proud get their thought process in a knot. Jim Collins, who you may have uh, liked or been forced to read his book, Good to Great, uh, with some of the corporate principles, he also wrote another book called How the Mighty Fall. And in that, he looked at corporations and people that had done amazing things and then fell. I mean, we're talking from the top rung of the ladder and just a nosedive headfirst into chaos. And what he found is he profiled people in those institutions who fell. This is his quote. He says, almost always it was from a hubris born of success and the undisciplined pursuit of more. So we hear that well. Because to give in to the hubris, excessive pride of success, and the undisciplined pursuit of more is when maybe you start caring more about things than people when it's profits over workers, when it is, well, it's the kind of thing that, I don't know, makes somebody from Enron run off with all the pension. Makes us make unwise choices as a person or as a congregation or as a country that does not reflect our integrity and what we say we are and hope to be. So hear that well. I. In our worship planning meeting, one of the questions and just floated out there says, how do we preach this text to a wealthy congregation? You know, a congregation that is, for the most part, does really, really well. And it was, well, remember that it is not a matter of having stuff or doing stuff or being powerful. It is what you do with it. Do you use your power and your influence for the best way? Do you use your wealth and your goods in ways that honor Jesus? Not just on Christmas week and, you know, when we give money to the, the six major ministries of, out in the community, but day in and day out. Are we, am I, are you filled with mercy in your powerful and affluent lives? You may never know what difference it will make. I have a little story to tell you. It is not to make me look good. It's as much confession as everything else. But often, if I'm coming in from my Illinois house and I'm making hospital visits downtown, I come across the McKinley Bridge. There's always someone standing on that corner um, where you would cross McKinley and get on 270, or pardon me, 70. There's always someone standing there that is begging. And I have grown... Um, jaded. It's like, well, if it's, if it's Monday or Tuesday, it's usually this guy. If it's Wednesday or Thursday, it's this one. And something happened this past week as I was coming in, and it caught my attention. First of all, I admit it caught my attention because it was someone different. It was someone I had never seen standing on that corner. And it was 9 a.m. in the morning, and what really got me was guilt because I'd gone out to eat and had a really nice dinner the night before, okay, at a new restaurant, and all that stuff, and I thought, well, there's the person, and I wasn't going to give give him any money, but I thought, well, it's different, it's a different person, and then very clearly I said, oh, you can blow all that money on dinner last night, and you can't give this person a dollar, because please understand, I never think it's about their need, it's about my need to give, okay, so I rolled down the window, and I grabbed a bill out of my purse, and I handed her some money, she burst into tears, now, I, I don't want them bursting into tears because I don't know what to do with that and the light is going to turn green and, and let's just have a, let's have a nice, neat, simple economic transaction at the corner so we can continue on. But she burst into tears. And I mean, there were real tears and she was crying a lot and she started to sob and, and the light was still red so there was no escaping. And I just looked at her and she goes, I've been out here for three hours already and you're the only person that's even looked at me. 
we never know how a simple act of mercy that may mean so little to us can change so much. It can change so much. And for that moment, God was breaking in at the corner of 70 and whatever that road is that goes across the McKinley Bridge. Mary talks that God wants the hungry to be fed. She also says for the rich to go away empty. That does not mean that we don't gather goods, but we don't store them up in barns. We give them away as we can. You know, that might get her branded with a particular label. It might get her branded as a socialist. And we can debate all kinds of solutions. And I am actually glad that there's lots of conversation about oppression, lots of conversation about poverty, lots of con conversations about solutions and, and oppression in the many areas of life. And I am glad that we are either urgently wanting to be or we are forced into some of these conversations right now in this time in our place. And it can come from many, many different ways to go at a solution. I encourage you to be engaged in those debates and, as Christians, there are a few things that are not up for debate. If we take the name of Christ, we cannot debate that God cares about those who don't have enough to eat. We cannot debate that God cares for the least of these. We can't debate that we are among those with the most and that we have a responsibility and a connection and a tie with our brothers and sisters here and around the globe. Those things are not up for debate in the New Testament, and we ignore it at our own peril. Because God will lift the lowly and fill the hungry as those who have collaborate. God's people say, use me, God. And our understanding of God grows, and it fills us, and your heart, your heart might suddenly grow three sizes bigger when you didn't expect it at all. We find ourselves in the season of Advent changed so that we can't help but jump for joy at the thought of even our little part in what it means to do justice and to love mercy. To fill and to lift, it takes selflessness, it takes sacrifice, it takes conviction, it takes courage, sometimes it just <clears throat> takes stopping and looking up but it always takes putting Jesus first. So are we mercy filled? How will you impact your area, engage in the epic battles of our times using your influence? You know, Mother Teresa was the one who said, small things done with great love can change the world. So we model being merciful, being mercy filled, so our lives can sing this dangerous song of God's deliverance and expectations until every last verse has rung out, until it is not only not forbidden, but actively sought in thought and word and deed. And then Jesus, I think Jesus would jump for joy as we live for him. Amen in this season of formation. <coughs>